<laughs> In fact, I think I speak for a lot of people, Jews and Christians alike, when I say that I am hopelessly devoted to God. Translated for people. Okay, let's take a look at it. So, so the very first scene of prayer, which I, again, I am going to assert that it is a, is a scene of prayer, is not overtly a scene of prayer. If, depending on what translation you look at, it may or may not be prayer. So that's part of what's interesting about this scene. And it might have surprised you to see it on here. And that's the scene of Cain responding to God after God tells him what his punishment will be for killing his brother Abel. Just to recap the story, Cain killed his brother Abel. The background of it was, uh, was worship, which is interesting in its own right. He did not like God's reaction to his worship. In contrast to God's more favorable reaction to his brother's worship, and he he got, he got angry and he killed his brother. God then says to him that you are not going to be able to farm the land. You're not going to be able, and that will not that will give you a lack of stability. You are going to be a wanderer, wandering from place to place. And then Cain speaks, and this is the text we have in front of us. Let's take a look at it. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And in the Hebrew, I put this here, I put the, the standard translation, I can bear. The reason I, I put that there is that when I looked on my favorite toy, Bible Gateway, and looked at 50 different translations of this verse, all 50, imply that the word bear here is that Cain was saying that he could not bear his sin. Almost all of them said the word I. And even the ones that didn't said, my sin is too great to bear. And the simple meaning of the verse, as we've all heard it, is that it's too much for Cain to bear his sin. We're going to read the rest of, the, of these verses, and then I will share with you what's in the Hebrew and the ambiguity of the Hebrew, which allows for, for different interpretations and, and uh, see something interesting. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Indeed, you have driven me out this day from the face of the earth. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, Therefore, Whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. The two words that are most open to interpretation and, and worthy of study in this passage are the word mean this so, then can be carried or then can be born in that, that I indicated, was translated loosely as that then I can bear in the English. And the second word is the word therefore. <coughs> therefore, when God responds to Cain and says therefore, what does he mean? Because when I say therefore, it means as a result of X, <coughs> therefore Y. What is the X? that God is responding to. Let's first take a simple reading that I had as well up until a few days ago when I was really looking carefully at this, and that certainly all the English translations say. The simple reading is that Cain is saying, woe is me, what I've done is so terrible that I cannot bear it, it's too much to carry. Apparently, he's responding to the punishment. God told him what his punishment is. So really, when he says, my sin, oh, I'm sorry. It says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Ooh, I left that in there. The Hebrew is avomi, which does not mean my punishment. It means my sin. 
the Hebrew word for punishment there, I should have, I should have changed that, because that, that's just a, that's a, a, uh, that's a translation that is based on trying to make the narrative flow better. With all due respect to the translators. Do I spend too much time criticizing translators? The exact translation of the Hebrew is, the Hebrew is, for those who know little Hebrew, I'll say it, Gadol Avoni Miniso. He says three words. My punishment is greater than I can bear. It's actually three words in Hebrew. Gadol, it is greater. Avoni, my transgression. Miniso, from being carried, or from being born, from being born with an evil. That's what he says. Since in the text it appears that he's responding to the fact that God just gave him a really serious punishment, the translators felt it okay, because that's also how we think of the story, that he's going, wow, that punishment is really, really heavy. That punishment is too much for me to bear. But that's not what my transgression is too much to bear means. Think about it. If kid does something wrong, I give him a punishment. If he complains that it's too much to bear, generally he's referring to the punishment. What he's saying is your punishment was too harsh. Well, then he should have said, my punishment is too much to bear. That's not what he said. The problem is that it seems like God agrees with that because God mitigates the punishment, makes it a little easier to take, and says, okay, you're right. Got a problem here, it's gonna, you know, okay, I'll make a modification, make it a little easier on you. So it sounds like it's talking about the punishment, then why would the Hebrews say, my transgression is too much to bear? It's debatable whether this is prayer. I'm calling it prayer because it's a person talking to God and asking for something. He feels helpless. He feels regretful. Perhaps. If it's the punishment that is too great for, for him to bear, then he might not be regretful. But if it's the transgression that's too great to bear, that sounds like repentance. Does everyone catch what I just said? Should I say it again? Let me say it again. If my... I have kids. If I punish one of my kids, and they say the punishment is too harsh, are they showing regret for what they did? No. Complaining that a punishment is too harsh is not repentance. Saying, oh wow, based on your punishment, I now understand that my transgression was so great, that sounds like regret. My transgression is too much to bear. He realizes the gravity of what he did. Let's go further. When he says, You have driven me out this day from the face of the earth, I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fusion and a vagabond on this earth. Anyone who finds me will kill me. He in introduces it with the word indeed. Indeed. The Hebrew word is hen. Hen is a word that is often stated in, as agreement. When Laban and Jacob are negotiating, Laban agrees, he says hen. The word hen seems to imply agreement. It, it appears a lot in, in scripture. It would be extremely boring if I went through many, many examples of the word hen. The word hang, it, it, the word indeed seems to imply in many, many cases someone is agreeing to what has been done, what has been stated. That wouldn't work well if he was complaining about it. He's complaining about the, the severity of the punishment. He shouldn't be saying the word hang, which implies agreement. He should be saying the word but, or something like that. Or the word behold. Why is he saying hang? There is one, I put in the brackets that the Hebrew is then can be carried, because I want you to understand that it doesn't say that I can carry, it just says to be carried, 
We don't know who's doing the carrying. And there's even one, the most famous in Jewish circles, the most famous commentator on scripture, Rashi, who lived in the, uh, the 11th century. He actually has a fascinating reading of this verse. I'm not going in that direction, but I'll share it with you. He says that Cain, continuing with his attitude of thinking he knows better than God, when God, you know, he doesn't like that God didn't accept his offering, and, and when God says, where's your brother, he's like, you know, he responds with a little freshness, that this is just a continuation of that. And he was saying, this is how he reads it. Is my punishment too great? Is my, is my transgression too great for you to bear? Saying to God, why don't you just, is my punishment so great that you can't lift it off? Close book. <laughs> so it's an ambiguous phrase. What was he saying? My transgression is too great to bear. Now I'm hidden from God's face. I'm not in, in the presence of the Lord anymore. And people are going to kill me. He's saying it as agreement. Strangely. But everyone interprets it as a complaint. But the word hain, which implies agreement, seems to be out of place. So here's what I'm suggesting. He was fully accepting his punishment. He was not complaining that it was too harsh. He's not complaining about the punishment. As I pointed out, he does not say the punishment is too great. He says, the trick. he realizes based on God's punishment, how severe his transgression is. He realizes that it means that he's no longer going to be standing before God in God's presence. He realizes that as a result of this, he's going to be a wanderer. And you know what? I'm going to get what's coming to me. Whoever finds me is going to kill me. I don't believe that Cain to God about the punishment. He says, indeed, he talks about how severe his transgression is, not how severe the punishment is. I believe he's simply making a statement. Wow. Sin can't be fixed. I sinned. I killed someone. God just gave me a punishment, and you know what? It's the right punishment. I destroy the image of God, human life, I'm no longer in the face of God. I killed someone, now I'm going to get killed. Wow. I misused the vegetation that I grew from the ground, the crops I grew, that was his offering. I don't get any more crops. The land won't give me anything. Cain was accepting the punishment. He was realizing how severe his sin was, and he believed, there was no way for him to know otherwise, that there are sins that are too, just too great. And that's why God says, therefore, let's go ahead. What's therefore? As I said, therefore means because of X, therefore Y. So the simple reading is, God hadn't thought of how severe the punishment was, and when Cain goes, you know, this punishment's really bad. Based on this, now I'm going to get killed. Go, oh yeah, you're right. You know, I hadn't thought of that. Okay, I'll, I'll fix that for you. God, God hadn't thought of it. I believe that therefore is God saying, ah, you're regretful. You accept responsibility. You, you're starting to understand what you did. Therefore, there's mercy. I believe that what we have here is the first example of a person standing before God, taking responsibility for what he's done, accepting the full responsibility and the full force of what he deserves, but also learning a lesson. Right at the beginning of humanity's journey on this earth, he learns that a repentant and regretful heart invokes the mercy of God. And that is our first lesson about prayer. There's something to learn from the first murder. What it is to feel that way and to stand before God and say, I get it. I get what I did. I get it. This is what I deserve. And God
God says, therefore, I'm going to make it a little lighter. Now we have uh, Abram 1, because his name wasn't Abraham yet, and then Abraham 2, and Abraham 3. Three scenes of prayer. What we're going to do here is we're going to look at them first separately, drawing out some lessons from Abraham's prayer. And then we're going, I'm going to point out something that they all share, a few things they all share, and we're going to draw out even more lessons from Abraham's prayer. Okay? But let's first take a look at them separately. The first prayer we have here is uh, Genesis chapter 15. And again, how do we define prayer? Well, I think when someone turns to God and asks for something, I'm going I'm to call that prayer. Yes? It says, uh, whoever kills Cain, who is that? Who's the whoever? Like, who else is walking around on earth? That's right. They're, they're, what we see later on, there's more people. These people live very long lives, and that allowed for, multi, for many more generations to live simultaneously than we have. <coughs> that it might have taken a cane and well to come to this uh, conclusion. In other words, they either could have been people more, or why we were discussing it before you got around to discussing it like this. So the population already forming. You know, so, it, 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 I, I'm going to refrain from going on a tangent here. Because, because of things that I want to do, but I'll say this. In our, in our rabbinic lore, in the Midrash, which is very often gives us backstory, things that are going on in the scripture that were passed down, uh, there's an interpretation of a verse that comes a little bit later, which actually says that someone did kill by mistake. And it's implied in a very cryptic verse that comes a little bit later. We can talk about it after the session or if there's time, if when we finish, there's time for questions. Before we take questions, I'll go right back to that and share that, that thought with you. Okay? All right. Let's go to Abraham's prayer. Now, and I read through every verse of the life of Abraham, looking for anything that could be called prayer. And it seems to me that these are the only three times Abraham prays. Abraham has a great relationship with God. God's talking to him all the time. He's... There's a lot of things going on with Abraham and God, but in terms of Abraham turning to God and asking for something, or praying to God, I, I believe that, there, that these are the three. Okay, here we go. Um, this is Genesis 15. There has just been a war in the land of Canaan between a, a group of kings and another group of kings. Abraham's nephew, Lot, was taken captive, and Abraham gets his gang together, and they, and they, uh, and they fight in the war. And after that is done, uh, this is the opening verses of the covenant of the parts, you know, the, where, where animals were cut in half. Okay, so the opening verses of that scene are as follows. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward, or your reward is exceedingly great. There's a, two ways to read the verses, but that's not our issue. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Indeed, you have given me no offspring. Behold, one born in my house will be my heir. So I'm calling that prayer. It's Abraham turning to God. He gave me all these promises about my offspring about the great nation that's going to come for me. I have no kids. There's no children here. So what is all these promises? He's asking God, he's turning to God, and asking either for answers or for a child. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir. Meaning, the servant in your house is not going to be your heir. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And the scene goes on from there, covenant scene. So, 
let's first talk about what, what type of prayer this is. It's, of course, a, a request. It's a request. It's speaking to God, and we all do this. We speak to God, we, we have a need. But this isn't just a personal, private need. We don't see Abraham and Sarah were childless for many, many years, for decades. We could say that he prayed or say that he didn't pray, but all we have is what Scripture gives us. And this is the first time we see Abraham turn to God and ask for a child. So what's the context of asking for a child? Well, the context is the covenant. That's the context. And that already, going back to what I said out there in the museum, that already says something different. See, prayer in Mesopotamia, where Abraham came from, was all about personal needs, entirely. That was the only reason to pray. You prayed for your crops, you prayed to be safe from pestilence, from harm, you prayed for longevity. People pray, and that's, what, that's why they pray. That's why they had those little stand-ins for them when they weren't there. Praying for their own personal needs. In the first prayer we saw of Cain, that first, that was something of a completely different type. Accepting responsibility for one's sinful behavior. Accepting punishment. To a Mesopotamian to turn to God without some practical benefit, like putting money in the candy machine to get something, would be unheard of. Why would you even bother? The gods weren't even necessarily good or evil. They just were, they had desires and needs and wanted honor. And as long as you did it right, they'd give you what you want. So here on the surface, Abraham is doing what everyone else did. He's praying for fertility. But wouldn't we think that this is a conversation Abraham would have had with God before? The answer is it could be that he prayed for fertility. I imagine his wife was childless. He's very good. She must have prayed. But the point of this scene is that in the context of the covenant he's praying, God is giving him an everlasting covenant. He's telling him about future generations and, and, and what his offspring will do on this earth. And that's where he's saying to God, okay, I'm with you on the mission. How's that supposed to happen? So there's a bigger picture involved in his personal needs. To put it another way, he's looking for God to secure a distant future for him, through his children, that he, he, he personally won't be alive to see. question a little bit more, why we don't see Abraham praying for a child earlier. Again, we don't know if he did or didn't. We only have what Scripture gives us. Certainly the Scripture does not give us a scene of Abraham praying for a child. And, and it does for, we have such a scene for Isaac, which we're not going to look at tonight, but just, just to give a, a simple contrast, and it's not some great covenantal scene. There's a scene of Isaac praying because his wife is child. It's very simple. We don't have such a scene there. We don't know why. It's a question worth exploring. I'd like to throw out a suggestion, and I really say this only as a suggestion. It's, a, it's an interesting question. One possibility is that like everything else in Abraham's life, like everything that he does, and we'll see this playing out further, it's never about him and his personal needs. Abraham's life is always about the world. It's always about everyone else. He's always doing things for others. He goes to war for Lot. And he prays, as we'll soon see, for Sodom and Gomorrah. And God tells him he's going to be a, a, a father of, of a, or a leader of a multitude of nations. And that all the, people, all the families of the earth will be blessed through him. Abraham's life is about the whole world. So for Abraham to yearn for a child... That question, perhaps, that prayer came out of him when the question of the big picture of what the big mission in the world is going to be came up. That's when Abraham asks that question. Because Abraham's life is never about it.
It's, an, it's a question worth exploring. I'm just going to leave it there for a bit. We're going to come back to the scene, as I said, when we look at all three of these scenes together. And we're going to see something uh, very powerful about this prayer later. So bear with me. Abraham 2. Abraham 2, we're not going to read the whole, the whole text. It's quite well known. This is the, the story scene in Genesis 18 and 19 of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God, after the angels visit Abraham and Sarah, the angels make their way over to Sodom and Gomorrah, and God then says, let's read the, we'll read the bolded statements, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. God, to sum up, God says, Abraham is all about justice and righteousness. He's the... He's the one I know. He's the one whose children are going to be carrying out my will in the world. I'm, I have to clue him into what I'm doing here. So God clues him into what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's jump down to the next bold statement. And Abraham came near and said, and he stepped forward and said, Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And then we all know the negotiation. 50 righteous people, 40 righteous people, 30 righteous people. He starts going through. He wants to see if the merit of a few could save the city. <laughs> Far be it for you, from you, God, to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all earth do right? And the, the negotiation goes on. They don't find enough people. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Before we read the, 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 the next two verses, which are taken from the next chapter, let's just point out a few things about this prayer. This is a different kind of prayer. It's not a prayer for personal need. It's certainly not a prayer of confession or, or repentance, as it came. It's not a prayer asking for anything other than the salvation of a city or negotiating with God the salvation of the city. It's an exploration. He wants to understand the ways of God. Abraham wants justice. He wants what's right and what's good. And he wants God to perhaps show some compassion. Let's analyze some of the basics of this prayer that we could learn from. First and foremost, he is asking on behalf of others. That's more than that. Let's remember who Abraham is. Abraham, raised in the depths of pagan, polytheistic Ur in Mesopotamia, is the one person who is out there declaring the one God in the world. He travels away from his homeland, and still at this point, it's pretty much him. He and his wife. And they are trying to raise awareness of God in the world. Numerous times in the Abraham narratives, there's this verse that appears a couple times that says that Abraham called out the name of, the God, the name of God. He built an altar and he called out the name of God. He went to this place and he called out the name of God, which is a shorthand way of saying that that's what Abraham was doing. Abraham was going around and he was talking about God. And he was introducing the world to God, to a God who was about life and about mercy and about justice, who was one God. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Imagine you're on Abraham's team. You buy in. You want to, you know, you're, there's a verse that refers to the souls that they made in Haran. Right? There were people, there was an entourage. There were some people who, who heard what Abraham was saying. You're one of Abraham's followers, and you're idealistic, and you also want to fight the good fight. You want to spread the knowledge of God in the world. What do you think of Sodom and Gomorrah? Think about it. It's worse than, you know, it's worse than Northern California. Sodom and Gomorrah. You're Abraham. You're on Abraham's team. And now God is going to punish Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Sounds good to me. In fact, what better way to send the message of what is good and what is evil and what is right and what is wrong? You know, like, our team scores a big win if the evildoers in Sodom and Gomorrah get whacked, right? <laughs> and here's Abraham in this intense negotiation pleading with God to save Sodom and Gomorrah. No. Read the text. To save the whole city because there could be a few righteous people in there, but to save the whole city. He wants all... If there's ten righteous people, there's a lot more than ten people in Sodom and Gomorrah. He wants to save all those people because of a tiny percentage. That's what Abraham wants God to do. He doesn't want any of those evildoers to be killed. He wants them all saved because there could be a little bit in there that's good. And... Would you do the same thing? Would I do the same thing? Think of the people in society who represent the values that are most abhorrent to you. And imagine that you found out that God was going to bring retribution upon them for their sins. save them because they're his creations. Let's not be, let's not be uh, overly kind to these sinners. Abraham believes that so long as there's ten, it is a chance for all. This is, uh, Jewishly speaking, this is one of the sources for the minimum number of, of uh, to make a, a group to pray together is ten. So once you got ten, Anything can happen. But let's learn a lesson from that. This is a prayer not just for others, but for the others that represent everything that you're working against. And he's praying for them. It's also a prayer to understand God's ways. There's a lot of kind of philosophy in there, right? Justice, without justice, are, are you going to do justice? Would you kill righteous people with wicked people? You know, because... He could be asking that also. In that first question, are you going to kill the righteous with the wicked? He might be saying, look, oh God, even if you're going to do this, get the righteous people out of there. Maybe he wants to understand the ways of God. So that's also something to learn from, you know, in <coughs> prayer. It's okay for us to seek answers. It doesn't mean we're going to get them. But to cry out to God because we don't understand. And of course... Expressions concerned for justice and mercy. I put those next two verses in there. The verses from Genesis 19. I think they're two of the most interesting and dramatic verses in all of Scripture. I've always been captivated by these two verses. And Abraham arose early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. Why do I find this so dramatic? Let me explain. In Genesis 18, the, that we have most of our text from, where Abraham is praying to God, the, if, that's what we're focused on. We've got Abraham in dialogue with God. The last verse of that passage that Abraham returned to his place is the last verse of chapter 18. Chapter 19 then begins, if we're watching a movie, the camera shifts. And now we're in Sodom, and we're at Lot's house, and that crazy scene there with his daughter people of the city, and whatever else is going on, and, and the angels come to him, telling him they're going to destroy the city, and everything that goes on in Sodom, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his wife running away, is the narrative. There's no mention of Abraham in chapter 19, because again, the camera's not on him, it's on Lot, 
and everyone inside. And that goes on through the first 16 verses of the chapter. And then verse... Sorry, more than that. I'm not talking about the first uh, 26 verses of the chapter. First 26 verses of the chapter is Lot and his family and, and the angels and Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. And then verse 27 and 28, again, think about like a camera, you know, the camera shifts back. And we have Abraham getting up early in the morning, the day after the destruction, running out to the place where he had prayed, the place where he had stood before the Lord, which means the place where he had prayed. Right? Looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah and seeing it go up in smoke. And then the very next verse after this, stay with me, the very next verse right after this, Goes back to Lot, his daughters, the cave, the drinking, etc. For a whole bunch of verses. Meaning we have this long narrative. In Sodom, the destruction of Sodom, Lot's family, his wife, his daughters, all that, and, and, and the children that are born from that. And that whole scene is interrupted by these two verses. The camera shifts over, we see Abraham, shifts back. Now let's look at these verses more carefully. Anyone who's ever been to Masada? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've been to Masada. Almost everyone who's been to Masada. Good. If you've been to Masada or that part of the country, you can picture this scene very well. Sodom and Gomorrah are the areas in the Dead Sea uh, uh, basin there. The plain is the, the, those flatter areas down in the valley that used to be fertile before it got covered everything in salt. That's the area we're talking about. Abraham lives in the South Hebron Hills. So if you're going to travel out to a place where you could look and see Sodom and Gomorrah, picture him coming across those, those, those higher mountaintops, and he goes out to where you can see, you know what it is when you get up there on Masada, you go to Ein and you get to the high spot, you look out and you see the whole area open in front of you, and Abraham runs out there, you can picture him in the morning running out there, and there's smoke rising and everything's destroyed. That is the entire two verses. God doesn't say anything to Abraham. Abraham doesn't say anything to God. Nothing happens in this scene. All we have in this scene is Abraham seeing that the answer to his prayers was no. And the verse makes a point of telling us that he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah from the place where he had stood before the Lord. Does everyone see that? Abraham arose early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord and looked towards Son of Lord. We just learned something about his prayer that we didn't know before. While he was praying for Sodom and Gomorrah, he could see Sodom and Gomorrah. He gets up in the morning and goes to the place where he had stood before the Lord in prayer. And from that place, he looks at Sodom and Gomorrah and sees it going up in smoke. Meaning, that's where he was praying. From a place where he could see it. Folks, I think this is an important lesson. To pray in the presence of that which we're praying for. If we're praying for other people, you visit someone who's sick. Pray for them right there, while they're in your presence. When you're looking at something as you're praying for, you're going to pray for Jerusalem, it's great to do it anywhere. When you're here and you can see it, pray for it. When you're going to pray for something, having it in your sight, Abraham does that. Abraham prays for Sodom and Gomorrah while looking at Sodom and Gomorrah from a place where he could see Sodom and Gomorrah. There's something very deep and powerful about that. It's less of an abstraction. It's not what your imagination turned it into, it's what it is. In the presence of someone who's ill, that's the example I gave. When we pray for them in their presence, we feel their presence. We feel them, they feel us there. Our focus, our intent, is much deeper and stronger. But there's something even more powerful. I said this is two of the most powerful verses in the whole, in the whole scripture for me, and I'll tell you why. First of all, the fact that they're even here. 
It could have just continued the narrative of love and his daughters all the way to the end. And we would assume that Abraham knew about this. It never references it again anyway. It's not like Abraham being aware that the destruction actually happened is an important piece of the story. I think that there's an important lesson about prayer in these two verses. Open your hearts. Abraham's prayer is rejected. God says no. Abraham's praying to save Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. Abraham goes out there, he looks, he sees it destroyed. The most powerful thing about these verses is what's not in the verse. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make up a biblical verse that would sound really good. You ready? Here we go. Abraham arose early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked, you can follow along with me, and you'll notice where I add something in. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of the furnace, and Abraham fell upon his face and tore his garments. Great. He's just praying. Or then he turns to God and says, something. Moses does that a few times when he's very upset, when things look despairing, things look lost, he falls upon his face. I think the most powerful thing about this verse is that we see no change whatsoever in Abraham's relationship to God. He's praying and praying and praying. God rejects his prayer. God rejects his prayer completely. He accepts it. He goes on. Let's go to Abraham 3. This scene is where Abraham goes to the land of, of uh, Plishtim, and it's the second time that he claims that Sarah is his sister. She ends up, once again, in the palace. And at this time, God comes to Abimelech, the king of the Plishtim, in a dream. So let's read these verses. And God said to Abimelech in a dream, Indeed, I know that you did this in integrity of your heart. As Abimelech complains to God when he first says to him, you know, this woman's married. He says, well, I didn't know. I had no way of knowing that. You know, he said it was your sister. He's his sister. So God says, no, no. It's okay. You know, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. I, I also withheld you from sinning against me. And God says, don't worry about it. I know you, I know you were being good. And, try, and look, I, I, I prevented you from doing anything wrong anyway. I stopped you before you could do anything wrong. You're, you're fine. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife... For he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. A few verses of some uh, dialogue between Abimelech and Abraham, which we're not focusing on. And the end of the story is, so Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children. For the Lord had closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. This was information that had not been told to us earlier in the story. But we're told at the end of the story that after Abraham prays, everyone was having trouble having children, and now they could all have kids. Now we don't know how long this story took. Were they there for nine months? They were trying to have kids for those nine months. I think this, I'm going to suggest an interpretation of this, of this story that I've never seen anywhere, but it makes sense to me, based on a, an important lesson from this prayer. It's a funny prayer, because it's not coming, Abraham was kind of told to. He, he set up Abimelech, Abimelech gets in trouble with God, God says, go tell him to pray for you, he goes to he probably goes to Abraham and says, you know, God told me to tell you to pray. We don't have that piece of dialogue in the scripture, but when Abimelech asks Abraham to pray for him, he, he probably mentioned to him, by the way, when God was telling me everything that you did, he also told me to ask you to pray for me. Abraham prays. Mm -hmm. What's the point of this? What's the point of this little scene? Why did God do this to him? To Abimelech. I think the point is to teach us another lesson about prayer. 
And I think the lesson that we're being taught here about prayer is the lesson that people of great spiritual stature have greater power of prayer. And God wanted Avimelech and his kingdom to know that. And he wanted them to know that Abraham has a unique relationship to him. And this whole story set, sets up this punchline. He gets set up, but God stops him from doing any wrongdoing. Now, why is he getting punished? He didn't do anything wrong. Give the woman back if you don't. What, so all the women couldn't conceive children because Abimelech didn't sleep with Sarah and almost did because he didn't know. And it's a very strange story. But I think that God's agenda was very simple. I want people to know how powerful the prayer of great, righteous, holy people is. So I'm going to set up a situation, and the solution is going to be that Abraham prays, and look, all the, all the women give. But they all, unlike the prayer, this could have worked out like Sodom and Gomorrah. The answer could have been no. But all the women, everyone has a kid. Because Abraham prays. God listens to everybody's prayers. Do you know? If God listens to the prayers of the righteous more immediately or more frequently, doesn't that give us a great incentive to be righteous? Something to think about. I think God, my reading of the story, this is my own reading, it doesn't contradict the verses and it makes sense in the verses. But it also makes sense of like, how long did the story take? I believe that for a long time leading up to this story, everyone in this, in this palace was having a hard time having children. And I believe that the final line that says, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife, is not about because, of, because he took Sarah into the palace. You know what the very next verse after this verse is? You want to open a Bible and look? This verse is the last verse of Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20 ends. They bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. The very next verse, what's, what's chapter 21, verse 1? And the Lord remembered Sarah as he had said, and God did for Sarah as he had said he would, and she got pregnant and had a child. Very next verse is Sarah getting pregnant. There are two lessons about prayer that are taught by this story, and I believe that that's why the story is here. Number one, the prayers of the righteous are more powerful. Number two, if you pray for a blessing upon someone else, that's the best way to get that blessing upon yourself too. So what did God do? He made all, I'm going to read the text literally. The Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. Not now, for a while. They didn't know why. And then Abraham comes to visit, claims his wife's a sister, da 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 da. In the end, all setting up, Abraham praying, and now suddenly they can all have children, and then right afterwards Sarah has a child. For God had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah. Because he wanted to set up that lesson. To have Abraham pray for them, lesson number one, and as a result of Abraham praying for them, Sarah conceives, lesson number two. That's what I'd like to suggest. It's a creative reading of the verses, but it's there. Now I'd like to tie together all three Abraham prayers and point something out that is common to all of them. Two things that are common to all of them. And they're very powerful lessons about prayer. Number one, after Abraham, in Abraham number one, Abraham asks God for a child. He says, how could I have this covenant without a child? You know what happens right after the covenant of the parts? The very next narrative is Sarah walking, the very next narrative, right after the covenant of the parts is over, the very next verse states, the covenant of the parts is Genesis chapter 15, the covenant seen 
is over with verse 21, and chapter 16, verse, 20, verse 1, Sarai, the wife of Abraham, had not yet had children, and she had a maidservant named Hagar, and she gives Hagar to Abraham, and they have Ishmael. <coughs> Abraham number two he goes out to the place where he had prayed before God to see his prayers go up in smoke. What's the very next verse? And God, the Lord remembered Abraham when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and sent forth Lot and his daughters and some babies. And after Abraham prays for the house of Abimelech, some babies. Every time Abraham prays, babies. <laughs> but these are strange situations. Ishmael, Ammon, and Moab, the, da the incestuous, the daughters of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his, and, uh, the, the sons of an incestuous <laughs> relationship between Lot and his daughters, and all the people in the house of Abimelech, and Isaac. So, first of all, it's interesting to note that babies are born after each of these prayers. But there's something deeper. One of the interesting themes in Abraham's life that often gets lost is that Abraham was pretty much clueless about what was going on in his own life. Let me explain what I mean. God sends him to go to the land that he will show him. He shows up in the land, immediately there's a famine, and he has to leave. Okay? God also told him, when you go to that land, you're going to become a great nation. He still has no kids. Then God makes the promise again to him. He says, God, i got no kids. Then he comes out of that covenantal prophetic scene, and the first thing that happens is his wife walks over to him and says, by the way, you know, we don't have any kids. Why don't you take my maidservant? What does Abraham think when, when Sarai walks over to him with Hagar? Right after, he, he finished, the very next scene, right after the covenant with God, where he's asked God for a child, God said, you will have children from your own flesh. Don't worry. He wakes up out of this prophecy, and his wife walks in and says, Abraham, we have to talk. I got Hagar over here, maybe you could have a kid. He's probably so what does he automatically think? I just prayed. Now I got a kid. Covenant, kid. God never tells him the covenant's not through Ishmael. For 13 years, he assumes that this is the child. I mean, think about it, it makes perfect sense. God tells me we got a covenant. I say, hey, I don't have a kid. He says, don't worry about that. You'll have a kid, your own kid. It's not going to be a servant. It'll be your own kid. Don't worry, from your own loins. The very next day, his wife walks in. He never told her. He... And she walks in and says, take a guard. And then he has a kid. He assumes, why shouldn't he? Have we ever had, we pray, and the prayer gets answered, and we're just like, yeah, I prayed, and it got answered. Abraham didn't even know that his prayer wasn't even being answered. Then... So here we have an interesting prayer. Here's a lesson. Abraham prays. His prayer gets answered, but it's not. Think that happens to us too? We pray. It looks like our prayer got answered. We don't even know. Thirteen years later, when God says, you're going to have a child with Sarah, you know what he says to God? I got Ishmael already. It's right there in the, in the scripture. I got Ishmael. We already went through this, God. And he goes, no, 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 no. That kid's out. <laughs> really? There's another kid, and that's going to be the covenant. Abraham was not going And then, God tells him about Sodom and Gomorrah. He starts praying for them. God says, no. <laughs> Why didn't I tell me about this? God says, no. But he doesn't know that God did answer his prayer. Because the next verse after, when he goes out and sees his prayers go up in smoke, if you would ask Abraham at that point, were your prayers answered? Did God give you what you prayed for? He said, okay, well, I thought he did back when I prayed for a child, and it turns out I was wrong, because then, 13 years later, he told me that there's going to be another kid, which I don't have yet. So I don't know, but it looks like God said no. The very next verse says, God remembered Abraham, and he sent forth love. And love with his two daughters. One of them is named Ammon, and one of them is named Moab. 
Who's the most famous Moabite? You know, Ruth. Ruth. And Ruth is the great, 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 great grandmother of David, the Messiah. Whoa! Was Abraham's prayer answered? That all came from Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom, Abraham thinks that God is not saving the righteous or the righteousness that is in that disgusting pit of immorality. And he is. It's just Abraham not going to live to see it. His prayer was answered. She's not quite in the way that he's not. And then, he's in the house of Abimelech. He embarrasses himself, basically, with claiming his wife's sister a second time. And, it, and gets called on it by Abimelech. Who says, what are you doing to me? And then, as a kind of apology, he's got to pray for Abimelech. He prays for Abimelech's family. They all have children. When these women all start conceiving, what would Abraham say about that prayer? Yeah, that was the answer to my prayer. I prayed for them. Now they're all having children. Voila. <laughs> but what does the text say? The only reason God did all that was because of Sarah. And the very next verse, sure enough, is that she conceives. He wasn't praying for that. So he never prays for Sarah to conceive. She conceives. Abraham, in all three of these prayers, prays and does not know that he's being answered. He doesn't know if he is or isn't. He thinks he is, but he isn't. And then he thinks he isn't, but he is. And then he's answered, but then there's a different part of the answer that's even more important that he didn't know about. I just went through all three. Let me say them again. Abraham number one. He thinks he's got, he thinks the answer was yes. What a power. I asked God for, for a kid, and then here's Hagar. Now I got Ishmael. No. You think you were answered, but you weren't. Next prayer. He prays for Sodom and Gomorrah. He thinks he's, he wasn't answered. King David, he was. And then he prays for Abimelech. And he's like, okay, that one I know. I prayed for them to have children. They had children. Great. We're good. No. It's all about Isaac. It's all about Sarah. These are the lessons from Abraham's prayer. We don't know. It's our job to pray. Why does God tell him about Sodom and Gomorrah? He's setting him up for failure? God knows there aren't ten righteous people in the city. What is he doing to them? He says what? He says, I know that he's going to teach his children justice and morality, and that he's going to be the one to bear this torch in the world. I want him to work himself up and pray and plead with me to save these wicked people, and then I'm going to wipe them out. We need to go through that. Because that's who they're going to be. We have a lot to learn from this. When we arrogantly think we were answered, weren't, when we despairingly think we weren't answered, maybe we were, and everything in between. And through all of it, we don't see any wavering in Abraham's commitment to God. Let's close with the following. Hagar and Ishmael, this is short. By the way, there's a mistaken assumption. I was talking to people about, about prayer. I mentioned Hagar. And they started talking about how that, oh yeah, his whole name is Ishmael because God hears her prayer when she first gets kicked out of the house. But look at the text. She doesn't pray in that scene. In that first scene, she does not pray. The angel comes to her and says, God has heard your suffering. It never says that she, she never calls out. She never cries out to God in that in that first scene. So we're not going to deal with that scene. We're going to deal with this one. So interesting. This is where Hagar and Ishmael, after Isaac is born, Sarah doesn't like the scene here. Ishmael is a problem. You can imagine. He spent 13 years thinking that he was the bearer of the covenant and now he's not. Issues. He gets kicked out of the house with Hagar. They're out in the desert. Abraham reluctantly, uh, God tells him to listen to Sarah, throws him out of the house, and they're out there in the desert and they run out of water. The water was exhausted from the flats. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat down apart from him, or opposite him, it's an ambiguous word, 
a bow shot off. That's pretty far. How far can you shoot a bow and arrow? She's not sitting next to him. The text tells us she walks far away from him. A bow shot away from him. Why? For she said, let me not behold the death of the child. And she sat apart and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the Lamb. Did he hear heaven's voice? No. When we give up hope, that's when God stops us. Don't give up hope. You, you're walking away from your, from your child because you don't want to see him die. I know he's going to die. I don't want to see it. That's not a prayer. Whose voice does God hear? The voice of the Lamb. And the angel of God, just in case you missed it, the angel of God called to Hagar from the heavens and said to her, What's with you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the Lamb. There, where he is. In other words, what are you doing here? A cry of despair, giving up hope, all is lost. And you're sitting there crying, that's not a cry God hears. God hears the voice of the Lamb. Not the voice of Hagar. That's our last lesson for the night. Giving up hope is unacceptable. <coughs> that's not a prayer. Despair is not prayer. So we've seen many lessons tonight. We saw the prayer, just to sum up quickly, we saw the prayer of Cain, which was a prayer of the penitent, the repentant, regretful person who understands the gravity of what he's done and, and, and accepts, with all the pain that that has with it, accepts his punishment and, his, and the justice. And that is what invokes God's mercy to soften that, 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 that punishment. We have the prayer of Abraham for a child in the context of covenant context of fulfilling his mission. We have the prayer of Abraham for evil sinners, and we have the prayer of Abraham for the house of Abimelech. And we learned lessons from each of those. And finally, we have the prayer of Ishmael, which is only mentioned after the fact. It says that God heard his voice. He was obviously praying. That's the, the last prayer is not David. The last prayer is Ishmael. It's Ishmael's prayer. But set up as a foil for Hagar's Cries of despair, not people. Thank you very much for listening. Have a good night. We'll be here next week. And again, if you have contact information for us, so we can stay in touch.